Center for Christian Research and Documentation is extremely honored and privileged to greet Professor George Manacheri, an erudite scholar of great preeminence. We wish to place on record a few honors in his research with a great elan. Professor George Manacheri is an anthropologist, Indologist, historian of Syro Malabar Church, and history of Kerala. He is the editor of St. Thomas Christian Encyclopedia and the Indian Church History Classics. Professor Manacheri is also the recipient of the Order of St. Gregory the Great, known as the title of Chevalier. He won a number of awards, a few of which are P. Thomas History Award, Trichur and the first Syro Malabar Church Award for Historical, Archaeological and Alum. Professor George Manacheri was an executive committee member of the Kerala Sahitya Academy and a member of the Kerala Government Archaeology Advisory Board. In addition to his many TV appearances in India and abroad, he also collaborated with Channel 14, Munich TV, the National Geographic, the BBC, the CNN, and etc. in the production of documentaries with respect to Indian Christians and the Apostle Thomas. We in future request your support, sir, with all your research experiences in fulfilling the aims and objectives of CCRD. I now welcome Professor George Manacheri to present his paper before this August gathering. Thank you for all the big words. Uh, of course, uh, I, no. um, I am indebted to uh, Pandi Dure, my friend, for uh, many years. We were there at the New York seminar, afterwards at the Chennai seminar, and we planned the Jordan seminar also, but uh, it did not come off. Um, so, uh, Mr. Moderator and uh, Mr. Bhaskar Das. What's the problem? Uh, the title of this paper is Hidden Truths of Early Christianity in India. And uh, as you know, these three terms uh, require a little bit of clarification. We will hear talk about a number of truths about early Christianity. Early Christianity, that is Christianity in the first few centuries of the Christian era or the common era in India. That is India as understood by the world at large in around the first century AD or the common era. Truths which are often deliberately hidden and concealed and ignored by many so-called secular scholars and by those historians, even Christians, who aspire to be considered secular. The writer has chosen a dozen points so that they could be covered in the allotted time if five minutes are given to each point. The first point I would like to discuss is Thomas has been the subject of much calumny down the centuries and across the continents. In five of the documentaries, which was mentioned by uh, the elder daughter of uh, Panditare, I forget her name, with which the present writer collaborated uh, with the Channel 4, the Munich TV, the BBC, the National Geographic, and now I am working on one by the CNN. Apostle St. Thomas was invariably described as doubting Thomas by the script writer. Apostle Thomas is, among all the apostles, the subject of perhaps the largest number of European artworks, whether they be paintings or sculptures, and a large number of these deal with the so-called incredulity of St. Thomas. I show you a, some, a few of these, um, uh, whether it is by Caravaggio, the incredulity of St. Thomas, 
or by verrocchio, which we will come to later, the stained glasses of may, many French cathedrals. All these show Thomas's incredulity. This one feels is somewhat unfair because the character and faith of Apostle St. Thomas need to be studied, need to be studied in comparison with other biblical characters in similar situations. All these pictures, this is from Paliagra Thiruvalla, this is the one I mentioned first by Varocchio, the platform is by Botticelli. Uh, the, here also this is the unbelief of St. Thomas. Next. Uh, uh, this is on the left hand side you have got Moses. This is the Ottonian about 1000, uh, 1000 AD, uh, German. And the right hand side again the incredulity of St. Thomas. Um, you will see incredulity of uh, divine messages is not something peculiar to Thomas. Look at the next picture. Sarah laughed, we know. When Abraham was talking to the angels in the courtyard, Sarah, behind the door, was laughing. Because she did not believe what he was saying. In this old age, will, uh, uh, will Abraham be able to give me a child? In this old age, will I be able to bear a child? She laughed when the angels spoke. And in the next picture you see how Sakarya, good old Sakarya, he disbelieved and therefore he became dumb. And uh, again, next picture you will see how Mary, how could this be? Because I know no man. Angel is speaking on the other side. And he says, I, do, I, I couldn't uh, believe it. So all these people have been uh, unbelieving but they are not criticized by anybody. Only poor Thomas, you see, is uh, criticized for being doubting Thomas. You see that? But you must also remember, the others disbelieved angels and the Jehovah. But Thomas only disbelieved some human beings, like Peter, who lied three times in the one evening. Or uh, Mary Magdalene, whose reputation was not that good until two years back. So he only disbelieved these people, but they disbelieved the Jehovah and also the words of the angels. And still Thomas is described as the doubting Thomas all over the world. Um, three significant appearances of the Saint Thomas in the New Testament, only three places show his faith commit. There are other places where the list is there, but only three places where his um, faith, commitment, loyalty, and determination are shown. They are all in John, John 11, 16, John 14, 5, John 20, 24, 28. But okay, let it go. If they want to call him Doubting Thomas, it is their privilege. We need not quarrel with them. Before for proceeding further, okay, um, see, I have not given any footnotes because this is a paper and I won't be able to read the footnotes. So, for your information, practically all the things I have said here and many other things, because uh, 50 years I have been running after St. Thomas and the Christian Church, so these sites, these are my own sites. IndianChristianity.com, Nasrani with any Y because the pronunciation is like in money or honey, so that it is any Y and uh, Manacheri.org or ChaiOnline.net will give you a lot of articles and also some books I mentioned. I won't uh, refer to them hereafter. Next slide is uh, a select bibliography, the St. Thomas Christian Encyclopedia of India, um, three volumes. The Indian Thirty-Three Classics, projected three volumes, only one has come out called the Nasranis, published 1998. And uh, Indian Christians and Nation Building, a third millennium, a millennium inquiry, published in 2004 in, uh, at the behest of the CBCI and the KCBC. 
Then Kodungalur City of St. Thomas 1987, reprinted as Kodungalur Cradle of Christianity India in 2000. These are also, these last two are available on the site. There are many books also available on the site. In this site I have also uploaded a number of books because uh, that uh, book on um, Indian Church History Classics is full 15 books and long extracts from another tune. A brochure of that encyclopedia is available here at the counter. You can pick it up if you are interested. A few, few copies are there, you can pick it up. And also along with that I might say two little Malayalam books. One is called the, the Elephant and the Nasrani or the Elephant and the Christian. Uh, it is in Malayalam but a lot of pictures there you can see that. And also another book called the uh, uh, Mural Paintings in the Christian Churches. Mural Paintings. People think that mural paintings are the monopoly of some other people, not at all. The oldest, the best and the biggest murals in Kerala are in the churches. Pictures are there in that second book. Those, those who are interested can take uh, copies, they are free. But the brochure, only those interested would uh, uh, take. Okay. So that's all. We come to the next. Now you know, uh, even without the paper, uh, you see, in the first centuries, B.C. and A.D., travel between Egypt and Palestine on the one side and India was the commonest. It was the easiest. Because, you see in that picture the Red Sea, the Red Sea, um, above Somalia, above Somalia and below Yemen, you will see the Red Sea. Now it works. Oh, okay. This is another... Uh, okay, okay. Uh, these Somalians, even in the first centuries, had the same character. They were always pirates, taking away the ships which are going to the Red Sea in the first century. So much so, Augustus Caesar placed a big army there at the mouth of the Red Sea to prevent his ships from being captured by the Somali pirates. They are continuing their tradition. They are very true to their heritage. They are doing it even today. Even Indian ships, if they go by, they will take it off. But generally now, they don't kill. They don't kill the uh, captives. But they ask for a huge amount of money. They are only interested in the money. Why kill people unnecessarily? That is their policy. Uh, okay. It was so easy because at the mouth of the Red Sea, at the beginning of the monsoon winds, if you are in a sail, um, sailboat, sail ship, you simply open the sail at the beginning of the monsoon season, and automatically the ship comes to Muziris. Straight away to Muziris or some coast of Kerala, west, west coast of India. Automatically. In those days, in 40 days, says Pliny the Elder. But now this can be done probably in 27 days using the same wind because we have got better navigational uh, skill and um, uh, support. And then people will ask, are these people come to Kerala using the monsoon wind or to India? Now, when I say Kerala, it is a part of Tamilagam in those days. Don't say it is the today's Kerala, Travangur, as some are saying, or Cochin, no. It is a part of Tamilagam. You know, the Chara, Chola, Pandya kingdoms. I'm not going into that. So, they could come. And after three months, we have got the reverse monsoon. Reverse monsoon, no? the southeast monsoon. So at the end of three months, these people who come here, they will again get into their ship, open their sails, automatically go back to the Red Sea. And the Red Sea, you know, is there was no Suez Canal at that time. The French built the Suez Canal only some in the last two centuries. Then now a new Suez Canal has also been built, you will be seeing in the papers. But then there was no Suez Canal, so the Roman 
people will come to the upper portion, the north of this map, to Alexandria perhaps, and from there, using camels, they will come to the end of the uh, Red Sea, beginning of the Red Sea. From there, they will take ship, which will come straight to uh, India in 40 days with no problem. So it was so easy. People today think that it is uh, impossible. Uh, maybe you could go to, oh, I could go to perhaps. Okay. Oh. I, I, I am trying to go to another slide. I'm searching for another slide. I hope it is there. Okay, it doesn't matter. When the, I will talk about the slide straight away. I will leave my paper. Because together it is a bit difficult uh, to do more than one thing at the same time. So, um, I go back to this uh, paper, this map, you see. It was so easy to come to Kerala, 40 days only. Pliny says, Pliny says, in 40 days you could come to Kerala. Pliny, first century encyclopedist, died in 79 AD because he was a martyr to science. Because when Mount Vesuvius was bursting, his uh, nephew, Pliny the Younger, sister's son, told him some dust is coming in the air. He wanted to investigate. He had a scientific mind. He went with his ship, he was a general, in the ship into the, uh, into the area where there was this dust. He wanted to rescue a friend he was in that area. But unfortunately, when he went there, the dust became more thick and the lava began to flow and Pliny died, a martyr to science in 79 AD. So he has written how in 40 days they could come here. And also he has a big complaint, and that is, and this is recently, I think uh, six years back, the jewel of Oman. Originally they called it the jewel of Muscat, but then they called it the jewel of Oman. This came all the from, way from Oman, to Kerala coast and then to Singapore because the money was paid by the Singapore government. And when the ship reached there, the sail ship reached Singapore, they took the ship and put it in their museum there and it is still there in that museum. This is how this was constructed. All constructed by people from India and Kerala. People from Bepur where they do this construction of these ships even today which could travel the whole distance from India to the Red Sea back and so on. Uh, you will see the choir, Kerala's choir and so on there. See, this is a, another site of the same. And uh, this was a map made in the first century by Agrippa, another general of Augustus Caesar. He made this uh, map. But when he died, his sister engraved it on a piece of marble, which was copied always by a German monk, and now it is called the Pewtinger Tables. Pewtinger Tables. There you will see Musiris at the bottom. Musiris in the first century map. And also a temple of Augustus, just uh, next, left hand side of that uh, black circle. Uh, you will see the Augustus temple, even in the first century, in Musiris, in the vicinity of Kranganur or Kualun. Again, uh, there were pirates here also, it was not only the Somalians, uh, and the, you will see that Musiris there, and the temple of Augustus. So, I used to go very often to the Ostia Antica in Rome. You can go by metro, no expense. So their excavations of 2,000 years back are shown there. And uh, there are many temples, a similar symbol I wanted to locate there. Uh, so <laughs> these two pictures were taken then. They are not relevant to us. 2,000 year old statue, but head supplied from Kerala. And uh, the other one is the ghost in Macbeth. Some Cambridge students were in the amphitheater and acting uh, play, so they wanted a ghost. So I said, even a ghost, I have no problem, so that's it. Again, another picture which shows the route from the Red Sea to Musiris, South India. 
There were only four places famous in the first century. Origin, it is said uh, that the gospel has not been preached in the Gujarat area, says Origin. So says Usubius, his disciple. But uh, therefore people say there was no Christianity in India. This is because they don't know anything about the trade in India. There were four places connected with the foreign trade. One was Takshashila, mentioned elsewhere here. Takshashila, that is in the Gandhara. The second was uh, uh, Barigaisa or Broach in Gujarat. The third was Maziris in Kerala. The fourth was the East Coast, some vicinity of Mailapur. Four places. So when origin says Christianity has not been preached in near the Saraswati River in Gujarat, he means only of the four places, one place was not by touched by Christianity. The other three places, you know, even today, uh, already the people already spoke about uh, the Takti Bahi inscription of Takshashila uh, Pandidura, I think, and um, uh, the cross, there is a St. Thomas cross also discovered from Takshashila, which all I have printed, and um, Mailapur, you know, the tomb, the only place, as they say, the only one of three places where there is a cathedral above the tomb of an apostle. The other two, as you are, I should not tell these things to the people of Chennai, it will be carrying coal to Newcastle, I know, but still, uh, Rome, where uh, Peter's tomb, above that, the basilica, and uh, um, Compostela in Spain, above St. James's uh, tomb. Those who have read The Alchemist or Paolo Colo's other books will be very familiar with this particular shrine. He makes many pilgrimages to Compostela. Yes, so, uh, I think we have no more. Ah. So, another thing is, thousands of first century Roman coins, gold coins and silver coins, have been discovered in Kerala, first century coins of Nero, you know, gentleman who was fiddling where Rome was <laughs> burning, it is said. The left hand side you have got silver coins discovered from Kerala uh, under people had buried these coins in some pots. And uh, now these uh, coins, when they were, uh, uh, let us say, um, digging around the coconut tree and all, suddenly some pot comes up. It contains silver coins and gold coins of Nero. And uh, these king, these emperors, beginning with Augustus, Tiberius, um, Claudius, I think, I cannot read, up to Nero, about 120 years. These coins, gold coins in large numbers found in Kerala, places like Eyal near Palayur, places like uh, Valuvalli near Patanam, also near Parur, and uh, other such places. Thousands of gold coins of these Roman emperors. Why are they here? Because lo gold was coming in large quantities to Kerala. What were they buying? Pepper. Pliny says, Rome is losing 100 million gold coins every year for the purchase of goods from India, like pepper. And he says, what is this pepper? If it has some sweetness, it is all right. If its appearance is good also, it is all right. It has none of these things. Only some pungency it has got and uh, Rome is giving millions of uh, gold coins every year uh, to purchase it. And also the pearl. Um, this is Augustus coin. And this is Pliny's uh, 37 books called Natural History. I am not going into that. Ah. And Pliny also says, what about the Roman women? They are spending lot of money to buy the goods from India, like pearls. And he says, I saw Lolia Paulina one day. She was coming for a simple betrothal party. And she was wearing 
40 million gold coins worth of pearls in that uh, hair, hair, many layers, diamonds and also pearls layer after layer she was wearing. And Pliny says the Roman women are wearing pearls on their shoes even. Not only on the laces, I have the full words here, I am not quoting. Not only on the laces, but all around the shoes, they are wearing the pearls from India, from Musiris, he says. Um, then, um, also, you know, even today, gold has a higher price in India than anywhere else in the world. That is why this smuggling is taking place every now and then, contraband gold, and that is also why near Kudungallur, in my city of Trichur, we have the Trichur, the largest number of gold shops. Probably for 2,000 years, they were, they were experts in collecting these gold coins and uh, making ornaments. That's why the price is high. That is why this contraband is there in all our airports, uh, because uh, you can get a higher price for gold in India than any... I am not going into those things anymore. This is our paper, and this is one thing. The Musiris papers, first century papers, discovered now in the Vienna Museum, you archives, you will find this. It discusses the commodities and their prices paid by a merchant in Musiris, Kerala, by a Roman who is financing this fellow, and the taxes, 25%, 50% taxes, for ivory, two types of ivory. One is big original ivory tusk. Secondly, also um, the cuttings of ivory. Because, you know, every year, the tusk of the elephant is smoothened. You see that? So that also is ivory. That is second quality ivory for which 50% tax. The other ivory, 20, it's all in the series papers, 2000 year old papers. Okay. And even 300 years later, pepper was in great demand in Rome. Alaric the Goth, who defeated Rome, what did he ask as a ransom? ransom for uh, stopping the siege. He said, give me, don't give me diamond or anything like that or gold, I don't want. Give me 3,000 pounds of pepper to free the Roman senators. This is what he said. Very interesting gentleman, look at him. He defeated Rome. That's a surprise to the Romans. How? Somebody from a barbarian place could uh, defeat Rome. But it was a surprise. They thought they are the top. Mm, anyway, see, look at him. It will be very good to make a film like that, you know, some of our heroes sitting there, wine being served, and uh, so on and so forth. Okay. Oh, gone. What happened? Oh, it is there. Okay. This is Vasco de Gama's uh, cenotaph in Lisbon. They constructed a huge monastery, the biggest monastery at that time, with the 5% tax on pepper tax. Pepper tax, 5% of that tax, they constructed this huge monastery where Vasco da Gama is now resting. Originally, you know, he was resting where? In Kerala, in the St. Francis Church in Matanjeri. But then they thought our hero should not be in Kerala, he must be in Lisbon. So it was taken and buried now in this uh, cenotaph. Yes. Uh, I go to another point. See, I discussed three. When it is time, you can tell me. I will stop any time. I can go on talking for any number of hours, so <laughs> don't. <laughs> so. Uh, Five minutes? Ah, only five minutes. Okay. So, this is Alfred the Great. You know, Alfred, the most common Christian name in England. Okay, you tell me the time. 
is Thomas, not George. It ought to be their patron saint. Of course, George is the commonest name in Kerala. All are Vargises, Georges, Givargi, everybody. But uh, the most common name in England is Thomas. We know so many Thomases. Thomas Beckett, Thomas Carlyle, Thomas Moore, Thomas, uh, so many Thomases we know. Why? Because Alfred the Great, this is from the Anglo Chronicle, year 883. It says, Alfred was defeated in many battles. He made an offering. I will send some gifts to Peter in Rome and to Thomas in India in the ninth century. And he won the war. And then, unlike many of us who don't fulfill our offerings once the thing is achieved, but he sent a shipload of goods with the Bishop of Sherborne to Thomas in India. And what is more, that bishop came, he was not bishop at that time, he came back carrying ivory and aromatic oil from India in the year 880. This is not here, sir. This is in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle. Here, I, um, I took this photocopies in 1975 from the British Museum Library, which is today called the British Library. Uh, those I have given, I am not going into that because uh, I don't have time. Uh, this is, you know Marco Polo, I need not tell about him. People in this city, I should not talk about Marco Polo because you know, he has written about his visit to Chennai and how he visited the tomb of St. Thomas and a very great miracle that took place also he has described in great detail in his uh, uh, Kade and the the Chinese travels of Marco Polo. And um, these are the routes, how he came back from China to Madras and then to Kerala and so on and so forth. This map shows. So, this is a great man, Saint Aphraim. He has written many hymns, Gitas or uh, uh, hymns, Gathas, about um, Saint Thomas in which it is very clear that Thomas died in India. He says how the remains of his body, major part of his remains, were taken from India to Edessa. Afterwards it went to Chios, a Greece island, and now it is in Orthona, from where small bits are distributed to various uh, churches if you are in need of those. So, that is the story of uh, St. Thomas's remains. And it is said uh, afterwards that one bone remains still in that tomb here in Mylapore. And also some other relics. But I am not going to that. Again. Yes. Uh, I spoke about those, the story of uh, Thomas in French cathedrals. In the 13th century, much, because, much before Vasco de Gama had any dreams of India or Bartholomew dies, how the French cathedrals of Tours, Bourges, and Chartres have dozens of stained glass panels depicting the story of St. Thomas, how he came to India, how he worked some miracles, Gonda for us, this, that. Yeah. And we have got many copper, earliest copper plates, many of them, earliest rock edicts, many of them in Kerala are about Christians, like the Therisapulli copper plates. Seven leaves of copper leaves, uh, four are in the Orthodox uh, Devaloga Maramana, and three are in the Marthoma Pulatin, because when these churches divided, they also divided the copper plates. Four remained in the Devalogam Orthodox ceremony, and three went to the, um, what is it, the Pulatin, uh, the uh, seat of the Marthoma sect. You can see them today, yes. And uh, these are uh, copies of those copper plates, 849 AD. Many privileges are given to the Christians. 
like uh, Gatehouse, uh, like uh, Palanquin, oh, wow, 72 privileges. They are well known. I am not going into that. Oh, over. I think maybe I, I stop with that uh, because I, I, this is going back, I think. So, um, so what I have to say is, for any impartial scholar, there are hundreds of things in archaeology, in anthropology, in numismatics, in geography, trade route studies, everything, which all show that the visit of Thomas was quite probable, possible, and so on. Of course, we don't have any video clippings of Thomas entering India, unfortunately. But uh, apart from that, we have lots of things to show that this was possible. And even supposing, uh, from second century onwards, we have clear evidence for Christianity in India, from second century. So those people, some great scholars, who are some of them are my friends, who they say, you are not 2,000 years old. So I tell them, okay, I am satisfied to be 1,800 years old. That is sufficient for me. Is there anybody else who can claim that much of antiquity in India? So 1,800 years, quite sufficient. Not necessarily to, but we know this 2,000, but 1,800 is asked because, as uh, I think uh, he quoted Radhakrishnan saying, European countries were barbarians when India had Christianity. Uh, the names of the countries he already mentioned. I don't want to uh, offend the people from those countries, so I don't want to say those names again. So, uh, we have a great tradition and culture, art, uh, those are part of my paper also, art, architecture, lot of other things. Uh, those two little books will tell you something about that you can take, uh, those, who, those who get it first will get it free. Uh, art, architecture, so many things are there. So I think uh, instead of one hour, uh, Pandidore and uh, Faraday should have given me maybe one day or maybe one week. It would have been much better. But maybe another time they will give me one week or maybe one year to talk, I suppose. I will make use of that. Thank you. Thank you.